Everybody remember this slide, this, uh, this picture from uh, National Enquirer because it was a disreputable, uh, you know, journal? It's like, uh, that's the one on the left, by the way. Early 2000, hackers can turn your computer into a bomb. Well, luckily, uh, journalism has progressed since then. We've uh, become more educated, more aware, uh, except for the Telegraph, you know, July 24th, 2009, terrorists could use your, the Internet to launch a nuclear attack. The hype is still going on because it's still a topic that will scare people, okay? What this talk is going to be about is not going to be giving you the answers, sorry. It's going to be giving you hopefully some questions and stuff, you know, that you can start a discussion on. You can start actually uh, learning about what actual is uh, cyber warfare and what it means and, and what we can do about it. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've got two jobs. I've got a night job and a day job. My night job is I'm the CIO Strategy One Solutions, uh, pen testing company. We do uh, uh, penetration testing, uh, consulting, uh, incident response, corporate espionage. I've been an expert witness in a couple of RI cases, uh, against, not for, um, and also um, a, a couple of forensic analysis, you know, some of the fun stuff. My day job is I'm the AVP of a uh, major financial institution where I do incident handling, IDS monitoring, firewall monitoring, you know, all the boring stuff. It's like, uh, I say it halfway in just because I've had a lot of exciting uh, attacks and stuff, you know, that have gone on during the work day that we've been able to respond to. And that's one I think is the key thing is that it's about having fun. I tell people if you're in information security because, you know, it's a good career choice, you're losing. Okay? It's like uh, the other side's having a blast. We should too. And uh, speaking of hackers, it's like start off with one of the first ones that I know about. Uh, Sun Tzu. I tell people um, when you want to learn how to cook, you go to France. When you want to learn how to uh, paint, you go to Italy. When you want to learn how to do uh, military strategies, you go to China. It's like that's where it's from. It's like uh, 500 years ago, uh, 500 BC, warfare was very simple in China. Okay? I take all my guys with sharp pointy objects, you take all your guys with sharp pointy objects, you run at each other. Okay? Whoever dies the most loses. Pretty simple. <laughs> You know, Sun Tzu thought outside of the box. Sun Tzu decided to change the way those strategies were done. He would actually use the terrain to actually coerce the enemy or co uh, coax the enemy into terrain, into situations that would benefit him. He did the first buffer overflow by going into the valley and stuff, you know, and retreating and stuff, you know, and then letting his forces that weren't as numerous wipe the floor with his enemies. He did the first, uh, one of the first zero days. It's like he sent assassins into the uh, general's uh, tent. General's gone, war's over. Battle's won. So it's like I think uh, he's a hacker. So when I'm saying hacker, I'm not saying good hacker or bad hacker. I'm just saying hacker. Somebody thinks it's outside the box. So uh, I don't want to get up into the labels. Um, also, just to show you exactly how current Sun Tzu is, uh, 2,400 years later, this is a picture I took in Sao Paulo's airport um, at a bookstore. This book is being taught in Harvard and West Point, so it is definitely a good book to read. Let's go through the, uh, well, we're halfway through the intro so far, so good. You are still here. Awesome. Uh, then we're going to talk about some of the uh, caveats uh, about what this talk is about and, and how we're going to do it. Then a uh, history geography lesson that will be, you know, hopefully keep you awake. Uh, talk about some of the players and the haters and uh, how everybody here is actually involved. And then hopefully a good discussion in uh, room 104, or I'm sure here also. Before you get any further. Yes. If I think you don't mind. No problem. And I apologize. I wasn't here because we had a serious effort to get the stupids. Okay. I need to make an announcement. Oh. Um, sorry about not being here for Spot the Fed. Um, a serious outbreak of a case of the stupids came about. Um... You know, it was just last night when I was telling Hotel Security that when I came, I started DEF CON 4 doing this, and the kids at DEF CON 4 were now bringing their kids to DEF CON, and how as a community and as a, as a group, we had matured past a lot of the dumbass things we used to do. Well, Murphy's Law, of course, I had to be proved wrong. That, like I said, there's been a rash of an outbreak of the case of the stupids where several people now are going to jail uh, for felonies. Um, 
it's rare to see me this upset. I generally am an even-tempered person. I'm now very, very upset. We are, for lack of a better term, a community or a family. I expect better of you. DEF CON 9 was our worst year in terms of things that happened. We almost didn't come back. Thankfully, you guys stepped up and we did come back. Please do not make an ass out of yourselves and us by degrading back to that level. If you see someone about to do something stupid, instead of going either snitches get stitches or ha ha, that's going to be very funny, think for a minute, act your age, do not act like a 13 year old, and stop them. If you are planning to bungee jump off the roof, or you think it's funny to try to bungee jump off the roof, you will go to jail, you will face a felony, they will catch you, and we will be in more trouble. Is there anyone here who does not like the Alexis Park? Is there anyone here who would like to go to a hotel that's much worse than this? Please raise your hand. Because if you keep this up, we will not be here. Okay? I'm sorry to be a downer. I especially like the Sun Tzu zero, zero Day reference. That was pretty cool. I'm going to use that one myself, but I'm not going to credit you. Because <laughs> I'm an asshole. But it's okay. I'm in touch with my inner asshole. So. Um, don't agree too vehemently there, guys. Thank you. And no, TMI is pictures, and I'll be happy to provide them. <laughs> Just for you. Your own personal health. What's that? Yeah, you can wait, sir. Matter of fact, for you, you're going to wait a little bit longer. So blame him. Sock full of quarters. Meet him outside where there's no cameras. So please, guys, seriously, knock off the ass hattery. Okay? There's, there's, a, there's another incident where the fiance's in tears and the guy's walking out of here in handcuffs. He's going to spend at least two days in jail because they won't arraign him until Monday. And that goes for anybody else here. If you go to jail tonight, you're not seeing a judge until Monday. And remember, this is a casino. The rules are different here. They're much more severe. Please do not put yourselves or us in a position where they don't want us here. It just takes one asshole to screw it up for the rest of us. Okay? Thank you for your time. And I was thinking all the ways I could lose my train of thought, Jericho would be the worst. It's like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And I was... Where? Yes. <laughs> For my first presentation, this is going epically. Awesome. It's like... Uh... So... <laughs> So now what we're talking about is, where did I get this information? What's going on? How did I get started in it? It's like a, a little shameless plug. I just, start, uh, just wrote one book. I'm working on a second one. Um, and what that second book deals with is cyber warfare. Well, I want to be accurate. I want to try to get as much information as I can. And I started, do, started doing a lot of research on the Internet about cyber warfare and different reports. I totally ripped off a lot of stuff from the darkvisitor.com, which is an awesome website. Um, and I started getting all this information together. And I was like, you know what? It's like, um, maybe I can give a talk on it. So I gave a talk at a uh, cyber warfare uh, conference in Oklahoma City, and I realized one important thing. I'm reporting other people's work. All I'm doing is reading other people's research, forming my opinions on those. So I decided just within, the, within like a month, I got my passport for the first time. I went to XCON in Beijing. I went to CCC in Berlin. I uh, spoke at a conference in Brazil, and I went to uh, CISCAN in uh, Shanghai and PH Neutral in Berlin. I started going to these places. I started traveling, and I started trying to figure out exactly what's going on, talking to the people that are there at these hacking conferences and these security conferences, what their opinions of, were of their country, what they thought was going on toward them from, from other countries. So I was talking to the Chinese hackers about the West attacking them as well as, you know, 
the uh, East uh, attacking the West. It's like it's a two-way street there. And so that's what started getting me understanding. It's like we're understanding topics. We're understanding incidents. We're not really trying to learn the culture and the, also the motivation behind a lot of this. And so that's where I started trying to start investigating, trying to figure out exactly what are the motivators, what are the uh, things that we can foster discussion and start uh, better understanding what this topic is. Awesome. Because you're doing so well. Yes. one, you are doing very well in university. Mm. If there's a free seat, would you please raise your hand high? Everyone who is either in the back or the front, look at the dividing line here by the camera or whatever, would you please come forward and take a seat? We just want to make sure that then you cannot block the aisles. We're going to leave aisles open, okay? Really, you're talking that they wanted to get in. All right, thank you. We're making an exception. Okay. There should really be something besides Diet Pepsi in here. Mm. And we're back. Um, so one of the things I also want to make sure that there's a good caveat about, okay? This is my perception. This is my perspective from my experiences and the research that I've gathered, okay? I tell people, you take a diamond, you take that one facet, you hold it up to your eye, you're getting a distorted view. You're, getting, you're not getting the whole picture. It's going to be distorted. If you really want to appreciate the beauty of a diamond, you have to look away from it and look at all the facets, so I'm not saying I have the only facet. I'm not saying I have the only per, uh, perception and that my case is this is the way it works. You have other evidence. You have other perceptions. You have other experiences that helps bring this together. And that's another key thing. We all have to get all the facets communicating and stuff you know, so we can understand the picture a little bit better. Now let's start off. I, I, when I travel, I think this is a universal fact around the globe. We all have those cities that are out in the countryside uh, you know your neighbor, you keep the doors locked, uh, unlocked, he's like, you know your kids can go out and play and everything will be fine, right? It's like a nice little wholesome uh, little town. Well, guess what? You put your computer on the internet in that nice little wholesome town, your neighbors are Paraguay, China, Russia, the U.S., Canada, and they don't always like you. It's like uh, you're an opportunity for a resource for either uh, political motivations, for criminal motivations, you know, basically usually just money because they like sending spam. But that's what it's about. You're a number. You're no longer geographically fixated to one spot. You're now sharing bandwidth with the rest of the world, okay? That's one big global pool, and when one person pees in it, everybody's going to feel it. So that's what this is about. It's like you have to understand that there's a new way that we have to start thinking about geography. Um, this quote from Ambrose Pierce is one of my favorites. War is God's way of teaching Americans geography. Well, guess what? We have to learn a new way because the battlefield is no longer based in uh, the real world uh, today. It's in the boardroom. It's in the dorm room. It's located in Kansas as well as D.C., New York as well as Kiev. That's where these battles are happening now. So, yes, these are some of the people that we're going to be talking about. Yes, I'll probably be pissing some of them off, but that's just the way it goes. It's like, uh, talk about China, Russia. We're going to talk about some jihadism. Uh, we're talking about some of the more players that are out there. And, of course, you know, I call out us and, uh, and our friends. I'm not a for- sports player. I'm sorry. Okay? I don't play. I don't know that much about football, but I was assured, and, and someone guaranteed me that Terrell Owens fits the picture. He's, he's very talented. He does very well, but he's got a very big attitude people like to, you know, knock on. Am I right? Is that correct? Okay, good. That's awesome. Because that's China. It's like very talented, very good at what they do, and people like to hate on them, and, uh, and they've got a very bad attitude sometimes. Um, what I'm talking about here, though, is the, I want to start off with the definition of the Red Hacker Alliance. Everybody's familiar with the D.C. network, right? You're all part of D.C. something or other. Your area code, DC 405, DC 214, DC 4420. Okay, well, that's what this is about. The Red Hacker Alliance is exactly like that. They're DC groups, so to speak. They're online communities of hackers in China. Well, what happened, and we'll get to that in a little bit later, is that they started to form an alliance. Say, DC 405's got a problem, something's going on. They put out the message that they're having trouble. DC 4420 decides to join them in that cause. DC 214 decides to join them in the cause. And so instead of having one little group, you now have an army of people going after and attacking websites or doing what the, the purpose is of that goal. 
And when you're talking about the Chinese and the Red Hacker Alliance, you're talking during a mobilization over a million people. Okay? We're not talking about all Uber elite hackers coming after you. Okay? If I get shot with one BB gun, I'm going to get pissed. Okay? I get shot with a million, the effects are going to vary. Okay? And, and that's what this is all about. So it's like you also have to understand it's also about the numbers. But now, let's get into some of the other things that we don't talk about that much. The culture. We always hear about China. It's like, but we don't really take time to really understand some of the stuff about China. Um, a lot of the attacks, I think, are starting to lessen right now. It's like this last year, it's like you haven't heard that much in the news about the, the Chinese attacking here or the Chinese attacking there. And uh, one of my things that I learned while in my travels was one of the possible contributing factors is very simple. This is the year 6521. The Chinese have two astrological calendars. Those two calendars together form a 60-year cycle, which this is the ending of. So it's a very time of very, you know, of change, of things going one way or the other. Well, the ill omen part of this is 521. Five, 50 years ago, the Dalai Lama was at, uh, asked to leave. It's like uh, 20 years ago, there was a small incident in a square in Beijing. And 10 years ago, the uh, Fulong Gong was outlawed in China. So those omens coinciding with what's going on, maybe we need to think about exactly why Green Dam is being formed now. Why are they shutting down these social sites? October 1st is the 60th year anniversary of the ascension of Mao. So they're maybe a little nervous or trying to get everything, uh, their ducks in a row. Also, you have to ask yourself, if a hacker's trying to lay low now, at the beginning of the new Chinese New Year next year, what are they going to unleash? What are they going to bring out and stuff out of the toolbox that they've been waiting for? That'll give you a comforting thought right there on that one. Um, another thing that really totally torques me, okay, that picture on the left is not China. That's not China. That's like saying a whole picture of America, that's America. Okay, what about the Yankees and the Southerners and the East Coast, West Coast, you know, the whole Tupac Biggie rivalry? Come on. It's like it's a multifactorial, multicultural country. If this country's multicultural, uh, it's like, why aren't the others? In China, on the right, that's China. Multiple provinces, different languages, different cultures within those. And another little interesting fact Shanghai hackers love hacking Beijing hackers. It's awesome for them because they compromise those Beijing hackers' computers, form their botnets, take over their botnets, and then they lease those to other uh, nation states, other criminal organizations, and then they're actually going in and uh, you're getting an attack coming from China. There you go. Was that from China or was that from the person sponsoring the Chinese hackers and paying them? They don't care if it says it's coming from China because everybody likes to say that their attacks are coming from China. They're still getting paid. And then you got the Beijing hackers hacking the Shanghai hackers and doing the exact same thing. And then once again, you get your attack coming from China. Another uh, little tidbit is they started this a long time ago. Well, in internet years, it's a long time ago. 1997 was the formation of the, uh, the Green Army by Goodwill. Um, back in uh, 1988, was the anti-Chinese riots in Indonesia, that actually provided the catalyst. When I was talking about that call out to the DC groups, uh, in Indonesia they were having uh, a lot of uh, hard feelings with the Chinese immigrants and the Chinese nationals, and there was uh, beatings and attacks on a, a Chinese nationalist in Indonesia. Well, that started the formation of the Green Hacker Alliance, where all these hacker groups decided to come together and, and attack the Indonesian websites, Indonesian government, uh, and government sites. Uh, 2000, the Honker Union of China was founded by Lion. Uh, China Eagle Union was founded by Wan Tao. And uh, Java File was founded by Kul Swal and Buong. Um, one of the things on where are they now, uh, one of the things that mirrors the hacking culture in the U.S. and the uh, hacking culture in China is hackers grow old, okay? It's like, you know, being that outlaw bad guy and stuff, you know, it's like gets harder with age. Uh, Kevin Paulson, Mark Mayfred. Ring a bell, bad hackers gone legit. Goodwell, major security consultant now for billion dollar uh, companies and organizations and the Chinese government in China. 
uh, uh, Wan Tao, China Eagle Union, still around, but he's also an IBM researcher. So, you know, it's like you, you got to make a living somewhere and stuff. You know, sometimes it's, crime doesn't pay as well as, as you know, IBM. <laughs> so um, we all remember 2001, don't we? When I say 2001, there's a date popping up in your head. But what about April? April 2001. There was an um, Air Force plane flying over near China that collided with a Chinese jet fighter. That jet fighter pilot lost his life, and the uh, Air Force uh, crew on board were uh, guests of the Chinese government for a few weeks, and uh, during that time created a lot of tension. Well, U.S. hackers, not really understanding exactly the whole dynamics and obviously not knowing about the Red Hacker Alliance, decided to teach the Chinese a lesson and start an attack and web defacements uh, on Chinese websites to free the uh, crew. Well, guess who got the call out and guess what formed up? The Red Hacker Alliance got together and started the uh, Thousand Web uh, defacement, protesting the death of the Chinese pilot. And they won that one. But we learned. It's like we kept learning from our mistakes. One of the other things they talk about when you're talking about the Chinese hacking in the timeline was the year 2005. Because prior to that, 1997 up to around 2005, there was a major block for the Chinese hackers. There was, a, there was an impediment that they were having to overcome and it's a stumbling block that they had to deal with. English. All the hacking programs are in English. All the uh, programs and, and the key codes and stuff that you have to know are English. So that posed a problem. Not, not since 2005 when they started reverse engineering, they started uh, creating their programs in Chinese. Gray, uh, asked the UK government about that one, the Gray Pigeon Trojan and their mail system back in 2005. That's when we really got a good taste of Chinese ingenuity and uh, programming. Um, now, another thing I want to bring up about the culture of China is patriotism. I gave this talk in uh, Brazil, and saying that I'm a U.S. patriot in Brazil is a lot different than saying I'm a U.S. patriot in the U.S., but why does it being a patriot in one country make you less of a patriot in another? Just because they're from another country, you've got to understand when you talk about, once again, the Chinese culture, when you are born day one, you are Chinese. You are part of the collective. You are part of the group. Your ancestors were emperors. Your uh, civilization that you can trace back to the formation of your country was thousands of years. You're part of the Communist Party from birth, part of the collective. So they are very patriotic. They're very, they may disagree with their governments at points, but when the West attacks China, not the government, they attack China, they are attacking these, uh, these hackers. They're attacking these peoples, and they will respond in kind. It is, once again, part of the culture and how they operate and how they believe that they are Chinese and they should not be... Um, messed with. It's like, you know, they don't want to be called out. It's like you can talk about one uh, certain political areas and stuff, you know, but one that, that goes to the nationalism, uh, those are off limits. But another good thing is we export a lot of things here in the West. One of them is capitalism. Ask a certain India company, uh, company back in 2008 when they lost a bid uh, just by just narrowly missing that bid to the Chinese company. It wasn't until two months later that they found out that there were Chinese tro Trojans and programs in their network, which allowed the Chinese company to underbid them just as much. And before you start going and saying how bad the Chinese are about corporate espionage, it's like, uh, where's the French people in the room? Oh, there you are. It's like uh, other governments, let's say, are known to do corporate espionage on, the, on behalf of uh, companies. So that, that does go around. So let's uh, start off with the uh, Russians now. I want to say I'm drinking Pepsi because I'm allergic to polonium tea. Um, but uh, one of the things I do like about the uh, Russian uh, army is that they're honest about it. They don't hide it. They don't try to deny anything. They're right out there with it. The Russian 5th uh, uh, Division uh, Cyber Army. Uh, their military budget, 40 billion U.S. altogether. The global rating, you know, tied at number four. One of the key things is that their global warfare budget is $127 million 
offensive. Okay, come on, that's on the books. You're looking at least, least two billion off books, right? It's like I know there's some feds in here, and you know that's true. <laughs> so one, let's look at some of the toys they've got in their their little play chest. Uh, large advanced botnets for DDoS and espionage. Hmm. Botnets, DDoSs. I wonder if they've used that recently. Um, how about electromagnetic pulse weapons? Non-nuclear, thank goodness. Um, advanced dynamic exploitation capabilities. Wireless data communication jammers, trying to stop the flow of information. Uh, their cyber uh, weapons uh, capabilities rating is, is advanced. They know what they're doing. And they've got 23 uh, million uh, computers and uh, DSL connections to do something with it. I believe that if you give a cyber warfare talk now, it's the cardinal rule that you have to mention Estonia at least once. Uh, so I'm mentioning Estonia. It's like, uh, but not just uh, for the sake of being a good cyber warfare talk, but also because of the fact that we have to understand one important thing. Why? Instead of the technical and the political motivations, it's like I've got a theory. My perceptions, the way I look at it, the way I see it. Say I'm a major, you know, country, a very large country, and I've got to build a budget, say, of 120-something million dollars a year to build all kinds of really cool TDOSs and tools. Well, what's these having toys if you can't play with them? How are you going to test them? How are you going to get them in a real-world scenario? Well, what would it, how would you like to actually attack, say, another major country, like the U.S., five to ten years from now? You know, a country like the U.S. in five to ten years would have voting online. They have all their bill pays online. They'd be a very internet-connected uh, uh, community. It's like mostly all their uh, government uh, facilities and stuff, you know, are done uh, through the internet and connected through the internet. That would be great to be able to try to attack, you know, a country like that five to ten years from now. But how do you do it now? How do you see what the tools would react now? Well... In Estonia in April, um, and oh, by the way, you may not know about Estonia, but here's a couple of facts. Uh, they're one of the most wired countries in the world. Uh, they do all their voting online. They do all their bill pay online. Their government's highly connected. Their leader said that the Internet is a basic human right. Some would even say they're where America is going to be in, you know, five to ten years. But I'm sure that's coincidence. Let's keep going. Um, so uh, there was a uh, statue. It got moved. It got upset. That was opportunity. What happened afterwards may or may not have been government uh, motivated. Those may have been some tools coming out of the, play, uh, the toy chest uh, to be used in uh, you know, taking notes over and see how, what worked and what, what didn't work. But you can't just do one beta. Let's talk about beta 2.0. Let's talk about Georgia, okay? One of the key things that we learned in Estonia is a highly um, cyber attack is not as going to be totally as effective unless you mix a little, you know, couple bombs and tanks in there. It's like, it's about communication. That's the reason why I really don't like the, the term cyber warfare, and yes, I know I use it very frequently. Um, it's information warfare. That's the actual target. If I can deny my opponent information, if I can get information from my opponent he does not know that I have, it's like, or if I can disseminate false information, that's how battles are won. That is how wars are won. From the dawn of history, usually the wars have been hinging not just on the body count, but the information that is vital to create those plans and carry out those uh, attacks. So what do we have there? We had actual attacks on television stations and cell towers in the real world. At the same time, distributed denial of services attacks were happening to those same outlets. There was a coordinated attack. No, I do not have the graphs. I know people that do, and I can tell you who they are later. But they're out there where you can actually see the kinetic attack with the non-kinetic attack almost happening simultaneously. That was government-sponsored. That was an attack to see exactly what else can we do with these toys. Now let's go, uh, where's 3.0 going to happen? Kazakhstan might know. And another thing is, before you start talking and saying, it's like, well, this is preposterous. It's like, how would a, a major, you know, country deal with this? It's like, why would they do things like this? Are they really capable of doing that? Are they really capable of actually attacking 
uh, another nation like that and feeling the repercussions and stuff, you know, of the UN and all these other governing bodies that, you know, say no, no. Got gas? Russia cut the natural gas pipeline to Europe in January. Natural gas, you know, for heating, you know, it might help keep you warm. They cut the gas because they could. If that didn't take balls, I don't know what did, okay? That's the kind of country, that stuff, you know, that might be capable of doing a couple online attacks and stuff, you know, and seeing what they can get with it. This is my don't fought while me slide, okay? It's like because quite frankly and stuff, you know, I want to understand that once again, looking through those different facets, sometimes we narrow our facets to just one specific part of a religion and say, that's the religion. That's like from the West, if you're uh, from outside the, uh, the United States and you're watching television and you see some of these uh, churches that are doing church uh, uh, bombings and they're, they're doing all these uh, signs that say, you know, uh, God loves dead soldiers, uh, the U.S. can go to hell. Is that Christianity? I don't think so. It's one facet. That's one extreme. We can't just look at one slide. And one of the things I think a lot of people in the West haven't really read the Quran. They haven't really understood it. They haven't really tried to, to read it and find out what's in there. So some of them might be actually surprised to find out that Jesus Christ is actually mentioned in the Quran with reverence and respect. So that's just a little bit of food uh, for thought, you know, before I go in and start, talk, start talking about that one little facet. It's like, uh, but that's what we're talking about here. <laughs> so the funny thing about the, the jihadists, what people like to say, like in the Telegraph, they were talking about, you know, they want to start nuclear war. Three main reasons uh, the uh, jihadists use the Internet. Communication, recruitment, and propaganda. How do, they do the, how do they accomplish those three main things with the Internet? So when we talk about these online attacks and how they want to bring down the Internet, do we really think that they want to bring down the very means of their communication, propaganda, and recruitment? When you, can put, when you blow up a mall, okay, that's terrorism. That's terrifying, okay? When you take down Amazon.com, that's Black Thursday, okay? There is a difference with that. You have to understand the difference. And also, yes, cybercrime is, there are starting to fund more cybercrime. There are starting to actually get more involved with the uh, cybercrime and trying to get money off of that. Uh, you know what the biggest trade um, that the uh, jihadists are using to fund themselves with? I don't know, who said that? Fed, okay, I'm helping you guys out here, okay, because the last one went so bad, all right. So, yes, it's the drug trade. They feel that drugs are homoreb, which is, means forbidden. So what better way than to grow something and distribute something that kills the infidels and then use the money that they give you for that privilege to kill more infidels? I mean, that's, you know, a win-win situation for somebody. It's like, I still don't understand the virgins, but that's a whole other thing. All right. Now let's talk about some other guys because, you know, I, I really thoroughly want to piss off, you know, mostly every industrialized nation before I'm done. Um, so let's talk about South, South America. Brazilian hackers. Pretty cool. They're really good. You guys rock. It's like, but uh, Brazil, crimes, uh, hacking's not a criminal. It's not sexy. You know, it's not an outlaw thing. It's like, so you got mostly Brazilians hacking. Brazilians are not actually going after nation states trying to topple them. Uh, the Eastern Europe, you know, I, told, I talked about, you know, a little bit before about how we export things. We exported movies. Okay, we're real good, uh, the West is real good at exporting movies. Well, we shipped a couple good movies over there. Uh, the Godfather, Scarface, Goodfellas. Great entertainment unless you use it as a training video. Okay? <laughs> and that's exactly what the Eastern Europeans like. Good ideas. Now they brought that into, you know, online 2.0. So, you know... They'll hold your, uh, they'll ransom your files. They'll whack your website, you know. They'll do some drive-by malware on you, okay. They're learning, and they're, uh, they're still doing the physical real world, so that's all I'm going to talk about them too, so. Um, but once again, the reason why we're not talking about too much about them is because, you know, crime's not that much of warfare unless it's actually intended for that part, and it's really hard to tell. But one prediction that I do have, 
Within the next five to 10 years, every major industrialized nation will have a cyber warfare unit. We protect our food supply. We protect our trade routes. We protect our borders. Why not our bandwidth? When our economy and our government and our country runs on the internet, why wouldn't we protect those? So you're gonna start seeing these more uh, out there. And speaking of uh, Agent X and uh, the, North, the non-North Korean DDoS, as I like to call it, is exactly one of the formations and in, in the testings and the evolution of cyber warfare, of informational warfare, because this was informational warfare. It was disinformation. What is the best way to go and test reactions on a country? Well, first of all, you don't want to get caught. You know, I mean, hello. It's like, uh, it's, it's good and fun, you know, to, to trip the fire alarm as long as there's not a camera there, you know, catching you do it. So you, you make sure you have your fall guy and you launch attacks maybe at one enemy, uh, one enemy that you, of one person and then the ally of that enemy. So then everybody goes, okay, A and B are getting attacked. It's like, it must be C. Really? And, and you're thinking, it's like, no, Jason, that's too stupid. It's like, who would actually think that? Within a week of July 4th, a congressman was saying that we should attack North Korea. Okay? A little scary. Because, obviously, we're not really getting it here in the United States. The reason why, I mean, oh, by the way, at the guy next to you is starting to pucker a little bit, it's like, fed. I'm, try, I'm trying to help you, because by this time, they've already read that part of the slide, and, you know, they're wondering what I'm going to talk about next. Um, but let's start off with a 2004 Pentagon statement on the military readiness where they actually stated that for a response of a cyber warfare incident, they would actually consider a nuclear strike. Really? DDoS? You nuke the city? I'm dropping malware. There's a battalion coming for me. I start spamming, and there's a B-52. Well, actually, that would actually be pretty effective. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> okay. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, once again, we're trying to get there, but we're not really understanding it. 2003 was a really good lesson. Titan rain, okay? Not purple rain, much worse than this, okay? It was Titan rain, which actually woke up, you know, Americans say, no, people really do want to go after certain networks that we have. And uh, so, yes, they'll go after the Nippernet. It's like, what's going to be next? I said Nippernet. Did they see anybody react really? Okay. Because like, uh, maybe they couldn't read it all the way back there and stuff, you know. So it's like, I, I promise not to say, you know, skip or Sippernet and make someone going. Oh, wait. Sh sorry. Okay. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's, keep, let's keep where we're going. Oh, I'm calling everybody out. Okay. Everybody is starting. When I said five to ten years, cyber warfare, industrialized nations, no, we're already working there. Okay? South Koreans have already got one. They really need a lot of funding and stuff, you know, to get that going and stuff, you know. It's like it's not like they're a victim of attack, which could generate some sympathy to help shore that up. Um, that's just supposition and to hope to get a chuckle from somebody. Uh, but the Japanese, Germans just started one. They're getting one going. The UK's had one for a while. Right, Major? It's like, you case had it for a while. It's like, uh, and the Israelis. Yes, I mentioned the Israelis in the cyber warfare talk and stuff, you know, with government people. It's like late 1990s, Shimbot, uh, Israeli forces, you know, they did a little uh, Pijolo uh, uh, fuel depot north of Tel Aviv. Yeah, they got a cyber uh, warfare unit up real quick after that. So, Israeli fed, by the way. <laughs> so, what have we got to learn from this? Okay, one of the key things, we have to stop trying to learn things from this. We are trying to develop a way to uh, do battle in the future, you know, in tomorrow, with last year's technology and stuff, you know, and trying to get it together today. That's worked when you're building tanks and bombs and airplanes. We're not talking years now, we're talking nanoseconds. When the, you don't know where the new zero day is coming out. You don't know what the next vulnerability is going to be released. We have to start understanding the complexity and how fast these things change on the ground. And also the anonymity of from where these attacks come from. It's like, how do you do a proper offense when you don't really know who's the one shooting you? And I'm telling you, when you talk about cyber warfare and you talk about information warfare and you talk about all these different nation states, I tell you this. 
if a guy in his basement owns 100,000 computers and he targets your website on it, that's an attack. That's information warfare. Welcome to the new general. That's the way warfare is heading. It's not heading where it's just all the big boys get to play. Okay? It's no longer just, you know, this one army that you have to deal with. They're coming from all over different places, and yes, they're attacking from within. Like we've never seen that before. Did I mention I gave a conference in Oklahoma City? So now what do we do? Well, we have to start understanding what's going on. We have to start understanding without knowing, and I'm going to read because I hate reading from slides, but without understanding where the opponent's weaknesses are, you cannot borrow their strengths to use against them. Like I said, I like Chinese military quotes because they know what they're doing, and it's true. You have to start understanding the whole picture. Just like Sun Tzu said, you can't just understand one side of it anymore. You have to understand the other side. You have to understand both if you actually really want to be victorious in a battle. So, well, actually, this slide doesn't make sense now because I told you, you know, that we got to do it in room 104. Oh, by the way, that's it, dudes. No more tricks. That's, I started early, and I talked really fast. So...